That was the outcome of the Floyd Patterson Radnager fight. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me tell you what this is. This is the seventh show of the series of a brand new radio series. From Hollywood, we present the Stan Freeberg Show. With the music of Billy May. Plus the songs of Peggy Taylor with Doris Butler, June Foray, Peter Leach, and the Judge Conlon Rhythm Airs. You may not find us on your TV Because in case you did not know We're being brought to you on Brought to you on Brought to you on our API oh. Hello what is this bit of paper on the floor? Why, why, it's a newspaper clipping. Oh, will you read it, Stan, so we can, you know, get into the sketch. All right, Dawes. It says here, Dr. Hugo Gunk of Cornell <laughs> stated today at a press conference, and I quote, if the government would spend as much money training psychiatrists as it does training law enforcement officers, crime would be eliminated in 50 years. <laughs> no, no, I find that pretty hard to believe. 52 years, maybe. Yeah, well, uh, as it, as it, anyhow, this gives one pause to wonder uh, what it would do to the fearless six-gun-toting heroes of the radio serials. Would the U.S. Marshal become the U.S. Analyst and trade in his gun for a couch? End of quotation. Gosh, Dawes, you think they could ever make the Lone Ranger a psychiatrist? No, nah, it, it never, never would. Worked. Clinic into the west with the speed of light and a cloud of dust and the psychoanalyst manual in his hand. The lone analyst rides again. <laughs> Near the little town of New Rosies, New Mexico, a masked man and an Indian press forward into the gathering twilight. Hurry, Pronto. Press forward into the gathering twilight. Mm. <laughs> Got to get to Grandpa Snyder's if I'm going to straighten him out before he cracks up. Hemos lobby. <laughs> Faster, Pronto. Faster. Get him up, Scooter. <laughs> Gee, if it wasn't that we needed a switch on Get Him Up Scout, you could have a horse instead of a scooter. Hmm. Constant hopping play Havoc with Soul of Moccasin. Whoop. Whoops. A word of caution, Pronto. You have a choice of three things to say. Hmm. Get him up, Scooter. And chemo slobby, you have no other lines. Hmm. <laughs> How come you get all good lines? Look, you want to be the big man? Sit up here in the white horse and wear the mask? Is that it? Okay. That it? But what I do with Scooter? Forget it. Will you forget it? <clears throat> Look, there's a stranger up ahead. I'll ask for directions. Whoa, big fellow. Whoa, big fellow. Whoa, big fellow. Big fellow. is a big fellow. <laughs> Howdy, stranger. Howdy, do. How comes it you're wearing a mask? Going to a party? No, the... Because I dearly love parties. No, the, uh, the reason I wear it is so no one will know me. At the party, you mean? No, there is no party. Can you direct me to Grandpa Snyder's? Grandpa Snyder's? That's the party. I thought you said there weren't no party. <laughs> there isn't Grandpa Snyder's. Which way? Well, it's about two hoots and a holler down the road. I hope everybody gets paper hats and flavors. Hey, Slade, how about a little shot of old poop? No, I don't mind if I do. Hey, Luke, how come they're serving drinks to that kid down to the end of the bar? That ain't no young kid. That's old man Grisby. He's 104 years old. A hundred and four year old? Mm -hmm. Why, he's got a face like Bobby Breen. <laughs> how, how, how can he do it? Well, let's moosey up behind him quiet like. He's getting ready to order now. <laughs> hey, 
Hey, bartender, give me another shot of that Adolph's meat tenderizer. Holy <laughs> oh, fellow. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Greetings, gentlemen. Allow me to introduce myself. I am the lone analyst. Howdy, Alice. Have straight jacket. We'll travel. <laughs> going to the, uh, going to the party, eh? No, there is no party. That's a mighty strange-looking saddle you got on your horse, Annalise. Yes, it's the only saddle in these parts that opens up into a couch. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, Annalise, that's quite a rig. If you think this one's something, you should have seen the saddle a friend of mine had. He loved picnics, and his opened up into a redwood table and two benches. <laughs> It sounds like a real crazy saddle. Sure does. Sure was. Mmm, got him up, Scooter. Kimo Slobber. What did you say that for, Redskin? Mmm, no reason. Just making small talk. <laughs> Can you direct me to Grandpa Snyder's? Why, well, yeah, it's about two miles... <laughs> hey, say, how come that big white horse cackles instead of whinnying? <laughs> he has a complex. <laughs> He thinks he's a chicken. Well, you're the lone analyst. Why don't you straighten him out? I would, but I need the eggs. <laughs> Pronto. Uh. Through analysis, perhaps we may help. Hold it. Too piercing. <laughs> I say, through analysis, perhaps we can help Grandpa Snyder find the real him. Hmm. Did you say something? No. Indigestion. <laughs> Pronto, look. Up ahead. There's a shortcut. Come on, big fellow. Get him up, Scooter. <laughs> Darn it. Some wise guy painted a shortcut on those rocks. <laughs> Look off yonder, Grandpa. It's a masked man on a bent horse and an Indian on a bent scooter. <laughs> bent, huh? <laughs> Grandpa, have you been painting shortcuts on the rocks again? <laughs> yeah, I'm just a frustrated old man. Oh, big fellow. Howdy, folks. You must be Mrs. Snyder. Speaking, and this is Grandpa. Yes, he's the one I've come to see. Uh, what for? To straighten me out? Partly. I thought you said there weren't no partly. <laughs> there weren't. I mean, the boy. <laughs> Steady, Leghorn. Steady. Leghorn? That's a funny name for a horse. Yes, well, he has a mental block. He, he thinks he's a chicken. Well, that's nothing. We got a chicken over there who thinks he's a horse. Yes, well, I'm the lone analyst. I reckon as though it's my duty to straighten him out. Well, I appreciate your offer, analyst, but uh, we like the chicken to think he's a horse. Why? Because he's won the Kentucky Derby three years running, that's why. <laughs> oh, I see him now. The chicken wearing the little saddle and reading his press clippings. That's him. <laughs> Hold it. Where could he get a jockey small enough to ride him? Oh, he knows a gopher who thinks he's Willie Shoemaker. <laughs> I'll accept that. Uh, now, analyst, about Grandpa. He thinks he's a great Dane, and I can't tell him no different. I see. How long have you been obsessed with this idea? Ever since I was a pup. <laughs> Well, just, just lie down here on the couch, will you? Oh, no, she don't like me to get up on the couch. I'm supposed to stay in my basket. That's, that's nonsense. You're no more a dog than I am. Here, have a bone. Thanks, I'll bury it later. Now, repeat after me. I am not a Great Dane. I am not a Great Dane. I am Grandpa Snyder. 
I am Grandpa Snyder. And once again, I am not a Great Dane. I am Grandpa Snyder. I am not a Great Dane. I am Grandpa Snyder. Hey, hey Ma, I'm well. I'm well. Oh, my friend! Oh! oh, shuckins. He's gone. And I wanted to thank him. Who was that masked man, anyhow? Beats me, but I'm well. You are? Sure, feel my nose. <laughs> so much for analysis. <laughs> and now for another stirring moment, a very special guest. On our first show from the Basque region of France, you'll recall we presented Monsieur Marcel Toulet and his chorus of tuned sheep. Uh, at that time, uh, Monsieur Toulet told us that his brother Francois played the nose flute. Uh, Mr. Francois Toulet is here with us tonight. Again, due to a language barrier, I've asked our good friend Monsieur Devaru, who's familiar with the Basque dialect, to interpret for us. It is a great pleasure. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the nose flute is a bamboo tube. There's one hole into which the air is blown and two to let it out. Now, perhaps he will fill us in on how he plays it. I ask him. Long séparable temps en séparation, technique, puis le recevoir de nose flute, plein froid. Et le recevoir de ta He says he plays it with his nose. <laughs> Fine. Well, let's get a little history of the instrument. So, this is from the Basque region of France, eh? Long séparable Basque region of France, eh? Pour recevoir toi. He says he thinks you are off your rocker. <laughs> he got it in Hawaii. Uh, what did he say? What did he say? <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you that, but that's, a, that's Hawaiian. He has switched languages. Oh, fine. <laughs> Mr. Freeberg, we are undone. I cannot understand him. Billy, Billy May, you've done uh, quite a lot of time in the islands. Uh, <laughs> do, uh, <laughs> do you know the language? Sure, Daddy. Tahuya muya, puya kuya kuya, man. Tahuya kula ua. Tahihihi alua tutu amui poipu. Well, what did uh, Monsieur Toulet say? He says, like, man, the whole thing is bugging him, and if you'll knock off the quacking which he digs the least, he will get on with the nose flute turkey. <laughs> What did he say? Monsieur Toulet? Monsieur Billy May. Oh. <laughs> Never mind. What's he going to play, Billy? Music from the islands? I'll ask him. Ilue muya bula honolula scubadoo. Honolulu scubadoo, yaka hula dixie ula. He says like he only makes Dixie. Well, a bass playing Dixie land on the Hawaiian nose flute should be a novelty. Hit it, boys. <laughs> covers something like that. <laughs> I just like the nose flute concert, Peggy. Pretty moving, wasn't oh, it? Oh, indeed it was. I've never heard anything like it. No, you're not likely to. Peggy Taylor, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. And Sam, to get back to that nose flute, mm -hmm. what happens if you have to sneeze in the middle of a number? No, you don't understand, Peggy. The training of the nasal flautist is more rigid than yoga. Their self-control is amazing. <laughs> yes. And now I'd like to have you people know Peggy Taylor a little better. Peggy is going to do dancing on the ceiling. 
He dances overhead on the ceiling near my bed in my sight through the night I try to hide in vain underneath my counterpane there's my love up above I whisper, go away, my lover, it's not fair, but I'm so grateful to discover he's still there. I love my ceiling more since it is a dancing floor just for my love I whisper go away my lover it's not fair but I'm so grateful to discover he's still there I love my ceiling more since it is a dancing floor just for my Next May will mark the 89th anniversary of the driving of the Golden Spike that completed the first transcontinental railroad in the United States. Uh, it's a bit early to celebrate this event, but, uh, you know, better early than never. So our alert news staff brings you now a reenactment of the driving of the Golden Spike. <laughs> On the program that takes you back to historical moments, there you are. <laughs> This is Hal Wibley of There You Are. We're at Promontory Point, Utah, where the rails of the first transcontinental railroad will soon meet and be joined by a golden spike. They are now only one mile apart, and they are working like mad. While we are waiting for this historic meeting, we switch you to Chuck Grisby of There You Are. Thank you. This is Chuck Grimsby. I am stationed near the point where the rails will meet at the Iron Horse Bar and Grill. Beside me is Mr. Patrick Hammerhead Grogan. <laughs> The man who has been chosen to drive the Golden Spike. Mr. Grogan, will you tell us how you came to have the honor to be chosen as the man to drive the Golden Spike? Well, uh, you see, I was working on the track yesterday. Yes? And the fireman, he comes up to me and he says, Hey, Grogan, you doing anything tomorrow? <laughs> and I says, uh, no. So he says, the foreman says, Okay, you drive the golden spike. A remarkable story, Mr. Grogan. <laughs> now we switch you back to Hal Webley for a report on the progress of the track laying crew at Promontory Point. This is Hal Webley at Promontory Point. The crews are now three quarters of a mile apart and coming on fast. We switch you now to There You Are correspondent Rip Midgley. This is Rip Midgley at Ogden, Utah. I'm in the cab of the engine that will proceed from here to meet the train from the west at Promontory Point, where the Golden Spike is driven. The fireman and engineer are getting ready to start the engine, so let's listen. Hey, I beg your pardon, Mr. Engineer. Some coal? Yes, please, Mr. Fireman. Two lumps. <laughs> Cream? No, thanks. I'll take it black. <laughs> Very well, sir. We return you now to Howe Webley at Promontory Point. This is Hal Webley at Promontory Point. The track laying crews are now a half a mile apart and coming on fast. We switch you now to there you are, correspondent Speed Langley. Yes, this is Speed Langley. I'm in a signal tower at Speed Canyon, Nevada. Beside me is the signal man who will clear the track for the eastbound train, which will meet the westbound train at Promontory Point. Sir, will you describe the procedure you will follow to clear the track for the eastbound train? Well, sir, 
When I hear her coming down the line, I'll stick my head out the window, point my finger east, and holler, Okay, Charlie, just follow them tracks. <laughs> Are you pleased about being assigned to this important job, sir? I sure am. <laughs> I waited in this gal dang tower nigh on to five years before there was any track going by at all. And now we return you to Hal Webley. This is Hal Webley. The track layers are coming into the home stretch. The east is ahead by half a length, and they're coming on fast. They're approaching the finish line. The west is gaining. The west is at the finish line. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The track layers from the east have stopped. They're still two feet short of the finish line. I'm, I'm trying to get close to the track layers to find out why the east stopped so suddenly. Here's the foreman coming this way. Oh, sir, sir, would you mind telling me why the track layers from the east have stopped? We're short by two foot. <laughs> well, what can you do? We could go back to Chicago and push a little. <laughs> That would be quite time-consuming. Or, or I could slap in a two-foot piece. And your decision is? Slap in a two-foot piece, you fathead. Thank you, sir. Here, folks, is an Indian chief approaching. Oh, chief, will you tell our listeners what you think of the iron horse? Hmm, iron horse, bad medicine. Oh, what do you consider good medicine? Buffering. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Oh, pardon me. I see they've gotten their track and they're ready to drive the golden spike. Yes, folks, this is the big moment we've been waiting for. Mr. Grogan is stepping into position. He is grasping the golden spike in his left hand. He is raising the hammer with his right hand. Now he is about to drive that golden spike. There it goes. Down comes the hammer and... <laughs> Hit his thumb on the first try. <laughs> hey, now he's trying again. There he goes. He did it! He did it! The golden spike is driven. And now here comes the trains. One from the east and one from the west. <laughs> They're speeding to the meeting point. The historical spot at promontory point where the east and west will meet. They're getting closer. They're about to meet. I'd like to get President of the United States, Ulysses S. Grant, and get his reaction. Oh, Mr. President, would you say a few words about the meeting of the trains? <clears throat> it would appear to me they should have laid two tracks. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. to shout like that. Well, I... It's uh, like right in my ear, man. Well, it goes with the song, you Yeah, know. but don't holly my ear, man. Well, it's authentic calypso. Yeah, but like, why stand next to me, shout. man? Oh, well, the shout go with the bongo drums. Well, not my bongo drums, man. I mean, move away like. Well, I don't see why you can't, uh... No, no, no. Stand over next to the guitar, man. He sent me over here. <laughs> yeah. Well, then sing soft, man. You know what I mean? Like, wow. Okay. Stay. Too loud, man. Stay. That's better. Is a day, 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 oh. Daylight come and he wong, oh, oh. Yeah, man. <laughs> oh, we're called night and a drink of rum. Daylight come and he wong, go home. Stock banana till the morning come. Daylight come and me one go home. Lift six oh, foot, hold it, seven hold it, foot, hold it. eight hey. foot, punch. Daylight it's too come loud, man. It's too loud. Go home. Six foot, seven no, foot, hold it, eight man. Hold it, hold foot, it. punch. 
daylight. Oh, my ears, my ears, like my ears. No, hold it, man. No, it's too shrill, man. It's too pierced. Oh. <laughs> No, it's too piercing, man. It's too piercing. Well, I got through the shout. No, man, it's too piercing. Like, I don't dig loud noises. Well, you ruined the whole piercing. Record is what you do. Yeah. <laughs> well, tough. I'll take my bongos and go, man, because the whole thing is, like, bugging me anyhow. Yeah, well, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no I'm, I'm, cu- I, I'm cutting, man, like I didn't want to make this gig in the first place. No, wait, wait a minute. I'd be soft. I'd yeah. be soft. Yeah, well, back, back off from me, man. It's too piercing. Okay. Too loud, man. <laughs> Too loud, man. I can still hear you. Would you mind leaving the room? Okay. Crazy. <laughs> Daylight come and me one go home. Daylight come and me one go home. Hey, beautiful bunch of ripe bananas. Daylight come and me one go home. Hide the deadly. Black tarantula. Oh, they like come hey, man, don't, 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 don't sing home. about spiders. I mean, ooh, like I don't dig spiders. <laughs> he goes, he goes, hide it deadly. Black tarantula. Ooh. They like come and me one go home. Is that it? Can I leave now? No, not yet. We've got a big finish. Hey. Yeah, man. I locked myself out. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> I come through the window. Say that I come and be on the Wow. Thank you. My thanks to Peter Lees for interrupting me in the banana boat song. So, till next week then, uh, let's see, next week we'll bring you the lone psychiatrist, uh, Monsieur Toulet and his nose flute, uh, the banana boat song. Uh, no, that's what we did tonight, that's right. I don't know what we're going to do next week. Oh, yeah, we're going to do St. George and the Dragonette and many other things, too. So, until next week, this is Stan Freeberg saying thanks for listening, God bless you, and good night. <laughs> The Stan Freeberg Show is produced in Hollywood by Pete Barnum and is written by Stan Freeberg, Pete Barnum, Charles Butler, and Jack Roach. Featuring the music of Billy May, Judd Conlon for the Mayors, and the songs of Peggy Taylor with Charles Butler, Peter Lees, and June Perret. Bud Sewell speaking.